and welcome to another edition of Let's Talk ETC. I'm your host, Christian Severino, and today I have a special guest with me, Stephen Kinsella. Did I pronounce your name correctly? No, it's Stephen Kinsella, but that's close enough. <laughs> okay, Stephen Kinsella. And so um, I think you'll agree he's uh, uh, will be an interesting guest for us. Um, he is, uh, let me read his part of his Wikipedia page. So Stefan Kinzella is an American intellectual property lawyer, author, and deontological anarcho-capitalist. He attended Louisiana State University where he earned a Bachelor of <laughs> Science and Master of Science in Electrical Engineering. So he does have knowledge definitely of uh, technical aspects and a Juris Doctor from the Paul M. Hebert Law Center, and he also obtained an LLM at the University of London. He was formerly an adjunct scholar of the Ludwig von Mises, in von Mises Institute, faculty member of the Mises Academy, and he also co-founded the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom, C4SIF, of which he is currently the director. So... Wow. Uh, welcome and uh, congrats on that very impressive uh, resume. Thank you very much. So um, the reason I thought it would be interesting to have you on the show and and um, and I think the audience would agree. So a lot of people get into blockchain technology and Ethereum Classic, which um, is one of the main focuses of the show, because they have libertarian leanings. That's not a requirement, but I do notice it attracts a lot of those people. And they were all, or most of us are technically minded. And so a lot of times people will say things and I'll wonder us, well, you know, is that, is what you're saying really backed up by, do people that know about the law and economy more than developers, would they agree with the things people are saying. And so that's why I think you're a, a, a very helpful guest because you bring that that side of things. Um, we don't usually discuss things with uh, with lawyers and people that know so much about the economy. So um, why don't we why don't you why don't we start with why don't you describe from your website what a deontological libertarian is. Now on when I search for that on Wikipedia it came up that it was a the same thing as a natural rights libertarian. So can you kind of talk about that? Sure. Well, keep in mind that um, I didn't write that page, <laughs> so that's someone else's okay. description. Um, okay. I, I don't strongly disagree with it, but I think what the person writing that was trying to get at was um, there are – there's considered to be two basic types. Now, there are some people that think there are three or more, mm -hmm. but two basic types of approaches towards, say, ethics. Okay. okay. And to simplify it, they're empirical slash utilitarian and natural rights slash deontological. Okay. Okay. So, uh -huh. the, con so the first would be kind of a consequentialist approach, which is basically we're in favor of rules in society and laws. That lead to the greatest uh, benefit for society in general, right? Okay. Yeah. And that's sometimes called utilitarianism. It's an empirical approach that a lot of economists favor. Like they try to say, should we adjust the tax code this way? Should we have this kind of law? Who's going to benefit? Who's going to hurt? And we sum this up and we try to do the overall best good for society. Okay. All right. And then the deontological approach. Uh, and by the way, uh, people that are familiar with the philosophical idea of ontology, which is the philosophical study of the types of things that exist, um, mm -hmm. the words sound similar, but they're, they actually have nothing to do with, you, the, with each other. So deontology okay. and ontology have like literally nothing to do with each other. Okay. Deontological just means a, uh, an approach that is more rule or principled based, um, and that's why it's more geared towards the natural law. So the idea is that we're in favor of rules that are right no matter what the consequences. Okay, so that's the kind of classical division. Now, someone okay. like me, I wouldn't really I don't actually think there's a division. I think that the rules that are right and good 
sort of blend with and and complement the rules that lead to the best results for society on average. So I wouldn't really distinguish between the two. I think mm -hmm. people call me a deontological uh, anarchist and libertarian because I've written in, uh, I've written in the tradition of Ayn Rand, who's sort of an Aristotelian uh -huh. natural rights theorist, and Rothbard, who was in the Roth, uh, the natural rights tradition. But I myself have been more influenced by uh, Mises, Ludwig von Mises in economics, mm -hmm. who's an Austrian economist, and and by Hans Hermann Hoppe. Who is an, a German Austrian economist who has been influenced by Rothbard and Mises, but his his theory of rights is sort of a blend of consequentialism and and the natural rights approach. So we could get into that if it's interesting. But basically, I I prefer to view my approach as logical and consistent and principled. So uh -huh. we, you talk to other human beings that we live with. The ones that share similar values, basic values like peace, prosperity, cooperation, mm -hmm. and we say, listen, if you apply the rules of economics and logic and consistency and honesty and, and evidence to these things, what would, the, what would that lead you to conclude? So if we all are in favor of each other prosper, prospering and you know, everyone doing better in, in life… Uh -huh. And we have some awareness of the laws of economics, the basic laws of economics. Then, what what kind of like laws would we be in favor of? What kind of legal policies would be would we be in favor of? Okay, so you want me to answer that? So, okay, so two general classes of answers that I I that I hear to your question is there's the camp that says that we give everybody um, we respect everyone's freedom. And we leave people alone. That's what I think of when I think of libertarianism. I, I'm a simple guy. I only I think in simple definitions. That's how I would. You, your your definition was obviously much more sophisticated than mine. But I, I, that's like a broad category. And then I, I other people seem to want to focus on taking care of people. What yes. what we would call the socialistic approach, perhaps. And those okay. are kind of the two big answers that I see, and they're always okay. in conflict. Maybe not all the time, um, but but it, they those are the kind of the biggest div two divisions that I see. Would you agree with that? I see. Uh, I think um, I think from the uh, perspective that that I come from, uh, we don't we don't agree with all these bifurcations exactly because we see that there are loaded presuppositions in the way that these things are framed. Okay, um, and and so. It depends upon who we're, which audience we're speaking to, right? But okay. if if yeah, if I'm talking to someone that just um, is like dabbling in this or hasn't experienced the libertarian perspective on things, uh -huh. then that perspective that you just put out, so we would say that's a false dichotomy. Okay. That, that first of all, there's no conflict between rights, and there's no conflict between the desire to help people and the desire to protect people's individual property rights. We think that those things go together, okay. but there is a conflict between the idea of having a, a, a legal right, say a legal right to be taken care of mm -hmm. and a legal right to your property. They do, they do run in conflict with each other because um, – and this, this goes into what libertarians sometimes emphasize, the distinction between negative and positive rights. Okay. So basically libertarians tend to say that we believe in negative rights and, and, and the corresponding negative obligations, which means that um, you have a right to do whatever you want within your own territory basically and your own property, your own body as long right. as you don't invade someone else's rights, which is sort of what you stated earlier as the kind of rule of thumb way of looking at it. Um, right. And that could be viewed as a negative right because the only obligation or duty that it imposes upon your neighbors is for them not to do something. All they have to do is not invade your property. They have to not uh, hurt you. They have to not you know, steal from you. They have to not invade right. your pro – so the only burden you impose upon them is to just not do something, to refrain from doing something. I see. But if, if you believe in positive rights, which is the right to be educated, the right to a house, the right to food… Okay. Right. These kinds of things that requires that someone else has to have an obligation or a duty to provide you with it. Right. So if you have a right to an income, that means other people have the obligation to give that to you. 
but that means that you have a right to their property. Right. So, so there's always a conflict between the right that you have to your property and other people's rights to try to get a piece of it. Okay. So, positive right. welfare rights. Okay. So if I, if I understood you correctly, you, uh, uh, two of the points that you made were that you don't like these, you, these, some of these words that get banded about because they, they come with baggage. And so yes. we want to, you sound like you're obviously very precise on the language that you use, which yes. is good. And then also um, you said that the conflict between the two major camps comes whether we're obligated to do something or simply uh, simply have a r- right to be protected from doing something. But that it's the duty. If we the, the whether how much duty we have is the difference. Would that be a correct way to summarize it? Well, or it's the type of duty. Is it is it the duty or the obligation to refrain from doing something, or is it the duty to provide someone with something? Right. So uh-huh. it's it's easy to just mind your own business and stay within the borders of your own property. And if you want to in, cross the boundaries of someone else's property, basically, and use their property, you need to get their permission. You can't do it without their consent. Right. So all you have to do is refrain, refrain from crossing their property borders without their permission. And, and if you think of it in the simple, in the most basic case of, of, of human bodies, right? Human mm-hmm. bodies are a type of scarce resource, and the basic libertarian axiom would be self ownership. So every person owns their body, okay? Right, right. Which means the opposite of slavery, because slavery means someone gets to own someone else's body. Or in the case of say sexual relations. Can a man have sex with that woman's body? Whose decision is it? Is it the woman's decision or is it the man's decision? Right. And so the, the locus of control has to be with the actor himself that controls that body, and then libertarianism is just an extension of that basic idea, the idea that we are self-owners, that we own our own bodies, that slavery is impermissible. Mm-hmm. Extending that to other things in the world that we control and use as extensions of ourselves. So basically, the people have a natural intuition, intuitive opposition to slavery. They have a natural intuitive uh, belief in self-ownership by and large, mm-hmm. people that don't want to dominate each other, people that think that it's wrong to stab someone or kill them or mug them or attack them without their consent. We just extend that consistently to other scarce resources in the universe. Right. Now um, – now, to be honest, I so I don't have an economics degree. So I, when I listen to the libertarian arguments, they sound the most compelling to me personally. Mm-hmm. And this this isn't an argument in support of socialism, but I do see on TV that there are people that have pretty impressive credentials that disagree with libertarianism, and so you would think that they would know better. Uh, if they're if indeed they're wrong, and so let me ask you this: Have you heard any good arguments on the other side, arguing against libertarianism? Because there are some smart people. I think yes. you would agree that yes. So it's it's not just you know a bunch of knuckleheads yes. that. So what would you say to to that? Well, so I believe there's there are some positions that there are really no good arguments against. So for example. Um, the drug war or intellectual property, for example, which are two of my libertarian positions. So I believe that all patent and copyright law should be abolished, and all – so the drug war is completely illegitimate, and so is, say, conscription, the draft for, uh, for, for war. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't think there are really any good arguments for that, uh-huh. but for, for the state itself, for like um, a, a minimal state that does some functions instead of an anarchist position, which is what I hold… Yes, uh-huh. I think there are some honest arguments for that, and there are some decent arguments for that. Um, I think they're flawed, but I don't think they're they're crazy. So, for okay. for example, you know, you could argue that um, uh, if we live in a world as we do today, where there are states like China and Russia and other states, if the U.S. were to become anarchist, uh, what would happen if China were to threaten us with nuclear annihilation? What would happen to this anarchist regime? Maybe they couldn't defend themselves. Right, so right. that's a difficulty that anarchist theory has to has to grapple with, and there are other arguments like that. So I, I don't I don't deny that there are some honest disagreements about the basics. Um, 
But the farther you get away from a minimal state, say the argument that Robert Nozick argued for, like instead of having anarchy, we should have a, a minimal state or an ultra-minimal state or what some libertarians call the night watchman state. The farther you get away from that and the more you get into the modern democratic welfare state, which has uh -huh. broader and broader powers and unlimited taxing power, right. the right to conscript people for war, the right to throw people in jail for <laughs> smoking marijuana… Uh -huh. the, the farther you get away from the core functions that you could argue for as a public function, um, the, the, the more indefensible those arguments become, I believe. Okay, that makes sense. Um, now, I'm glad you brought up the term, uh, I think you said anarchist or anarcho-capitalist, because yes, that was… Yes, yes. Yeah. So there are different types of anarchists, and I'm right. an anarcho-capitalist or an anarcho-libertarian. Now, I, yeah, I, 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 I printed that Wikipedia page, so let me just – for the benefit of the listeners, let me say what the Wikipedia page said, because I've heard this term, and I really want to make sure to get it right. And then you tell me if you agree or okay. if you, you want to add to it. So sure. uh, an anarcho-capitalist advocates – the elimination of the state in favor of self-ownership, private property, and free markets. And they believe uh, that in the absence of um, a law by centralized decrees and legislation that society tends to contractually self-regulate and civilize through the discipline of a free market. And what surprised me the most or what was shocking to me was that they, they believe that courts of law will be operated privately so yes yes and and then um and then then they talked about the history murray rothbard was the yes. first person to use the term but the question that came to my mind which i'd love you to elaborate on is if the free market sets up a court system and somebody says well i don't care what you say i'm still going to do what i want anyway how do you who who has that final authority right. to enforce so how, how so can you kind of elaborate on on that kind of right. confusion that some people might have? Absolutely, and um, to, to be honest, I uh, I do a lot of interviews, and I I kind of <laughs> didn't realize I was doing uh, I didn't realize this was not a libertarian show, which is fine with me. <laughs> this is <actually laughs> kind of a pleasure. So, uh, but okay. I have to reorientate. reorientate my, let, let me just maybe explain a couple of basics just to make sure the, the people listening, because uh, if you were shocked by the private courts idea. Uh -huh. I, mean, I I just dropped a while ago the idea of private, uh, you know, uh, the idea of having no military and things like that. Um, well, I mean, I'm open to to, to ideas. Yeah, right, I right. just never heard that before. So right, but yeah, no, then, no, right. So let me explain the. the, the let <laughs> okay. me explain the, the the territory is this. Okay. Um, there, you had these old. <laughs> Oh, the history is vast. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, Brian Darty's book about uh, about the origins of libertarianism is good, but basically you had the old right. You had the you had the they had the the old liberals. You had all these strains of politics from the last two three hundred years. Okay, in uh -huh. the I say in in the in the fifties and sixties, Ayn Rand and Milton Friedman and these radical free market types emerged, and they sort of uh, allied to some degree with the conservatives. Uh -huh. For various tactical reasons, and they're seen as allied with them now, but in a way they're very leftist and very progressive because they're very pro-civil liberties, anti-drug war, anti-war, right. things like this. So they're really not categorized into the left-right spectrum. Um, yeah, they don't they the don't fit so were, nicely. They they don't fit in those those categories too well. Right. Right. So saying. we've come up with our own spectrum, which you can look up the Nolan chart. David Nolan, one of the early libertarians, came up with a two-dimensional chart. Which has two axes. One axis is personal freedom, and one axis is economic freedom. And libertarians believe in the maximum amount of both. Okay, whereas uh -huh. we would we would simplify and say uh, liberals or, or leftists believe in maybe a lot of e uh, personal freedoms like free speech and things like that, but not a lot of economic freedoms. And uh -huh. conservatives would be the opposite. They would believe in like low taxes, but uh, uh, regulating abortion and religion, things like that. Whereas we believe in high freedoms in both, and the original guys uh, sort of hark, harked back to the original founding fathers of the U.S. and they view the original founding constitution that era as more proto-libertarian because it was kind of a more minimalist government. They could only regulate a little bit. Right. And these guys are w what we now call minarchists, which means they believe in a very minimal state, a uh -huh. night watchman state. But there's emerged a more radical strain of anarchists who believe in 
like the government should not just be minimal but zero or the state. I should say the state, not the government because we distinguish between those two. Okay. Um, and – but there is a tradition of anarchists that has – long before the 50s and long before libertarians like the left anarchists, the syndicalists, the socialists, the communist anarchists, mm -hmm. and they all say they don't believe in the state. So you basically have different types of anarchists even today, and they all disagree with each other. So like the libertarian anarchists of which I am a part, uh -huh. and we call ourselves anarcho-capitalists because we believe there should not be a state… And there should be a private property order, okay? And I'll get to the court thing in a second. Okay. But we, we think that the socialist anarchists or the left anarchists are not true anarchists because the only way you could have socialism in a private system would be to have a state emerge to enforce those rules. Right. And they, they sort of think the opposite about us, right? So they think you could only have capitalism with the state to uh, protect the right the rights of the capitalist classes against the, the, the workers, et cetera. Okay. okay. So that's okay. sort of the landscape. Okay. okay. Now, um, so the idea is – the idea, and I'll put it as simply as, as possible, and by the way, because I'm a so-called deontological anarchist, my perspective on this is not quite the same as the other type of libertarians who are more pragmatic-minded. So they would just say uh, the state doesn't work, therefore it's bad. Okay, okay. so yeah. – and I kind of agree with that, but my view is more principled, and I would say that we have certain rights as human beings. We have a right to private property. You have a right to do whatever you want with your body and with the things that you homestead or acquire by contract peacefully without hurting anyone, and anything you want to do within that sphere is fine as long as you don't invade the equal rights of other people. That's basically the, the core idea of anarcho-libertarians, okay? mm -hmm. right. and if you have that framework… Then you basically oppose what we call aggression, and aggression means the, the use of someone else's property, including their body, without their consent. Okay, right. Basically, it means hitting someone or walking on their property without their permission. Right. Okay, so we basically favor peace and voluntarism and consent, and if you have that basic principle, then you apply it consistently. Then as Bastiat, the, the great uh, French thinker… Um, who wrote the law in the 1850s, as he explained, just because if something is impermissible for one person to do, it doesn't become permissible when a larger number of people vote, vote in favor of it. So right. if it's wrong for me to come… Confiscate property. property. Right. If, if it's wrong for me to steal from you, it's still wrong if a hundred of my neighbors get together and we pass a law saying we can steal from you and give it to the poor, which right. is like welfare. Right. So we, we think that you can't make something right just by majority vote, okay? Mm -hmm. And therefore, the state, by its nature, has to tax, which means take property by theft from people, mm -hmm. and it has to outlaw competing agencies, okay? So it has to be the monopolistic provider of law and justice and force in a given community. And mm -hmm. those two things combined, and actually either one of them uh, implies the other, mm -hmm. but… That's far afield, but those two things are both acts of aggression. They're basically acts of violence against innocent people who have done nothing wrong, and right. as libertarians, we say it's wrong. So we say the state is inherently aggressive and criminal. That's why we're anarchists because we think the state is illegitimate. Okay. Now, then the, then the practical issue is people say, well, what would society look like? If we abolish the state, right? Exactly. You're right. How are you going to protect from invasion and and yes, bad and, actors? Okay, yeah. And the pragmatic and consequentialist-minded libertarians, they sort of start from that area. They say that well, we would be better off if the government provided, if the private uh, companies provided the roads and education instead of the government, and uh -huh. so therefore we should favor it. But from my point of view, it's the other way around. We say it's wrong for the government to take money from me to build a road. It's wrong for the government to steal my house to make a road. It's wrong for the government to force my kid to go to school. It's wrong for the government to tax me and to, to pay for public education. So that's, a, that's the more deontological approach. It's a principled approach. It's like it's just wrong, mm -hmm. and then the question would be secondary to us of, well, then what would society look like in the absence of that? And from our point of view… This question would be similar to the abolition question of slavery during the antebellum South, where if you said we have to abolish slavery 
not because it's inefficient, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> not right. because it's an inefficient use of resources. We have to abolish slavery because it's wrong, because you're violating the rights of black slaves. Right. And, and if you said, I am in favor of abolition of slavery because it is a violation of human rights, it's wrong. And if someone said in opposition, but who would pick the cotton? Okay, you see, so to us that wouldn't be an opposite. That wouldn't be a, a good a argument. valid argument. Yes, yes. They, now, if they said, if they said, who would pick the cotton? If it's a genuine question, uh -huh. we can ask. We can, we can, we can, we can say, okay, well, we we can look into that. We can say, well, maybe. But if you ask the question rhetorically into the abolition of slavery, if you say, like, basically, listen, I know you want to abolish slavery, but I don't understand who would pick the cotton, and we have to have the cotton picked, and the uh -huh. slaves are picking it now. And so therefore, until you prove to me that the cotton will be picked as well and as efficiently after slavery than as before, until that point in time, we're not going to abolish it. The burden of proof is on you. All right. You see, we don't think that way. We think that the burden of proof is on them to justify slavery, and of course they can't. And then if the question is, okay, we have to abolish slavery, and who's going to pick the cotton? I don't know. We have to wait and see and figure it out. We're okay with that answer. So okay. that's the first kind of response. Now, of course, common sense will tell you who would pick the cotton. It would be you pay some labor, you invent machines or whatever. So uh -huh. in the case of the court system, um, it shouldn't be that shocking to you because there have been private court systems for all of history. Okay. And in, a, in fact, the, the entire oh, see, well, yeah. I mean, first of all, arbitration is is private. Yeah. Right? Okay. Contra I, I've heard of arbitration, and uh, I never had to go through it. But I, uh, I, okay. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. And and contracts are private because they're agreements negotiated between people, and they're like little legal systems between between the people that are parties to the contract. Mm -hmm. And not only that, the entire Western legal system that we're used to now, the the private law that we rely upon, was developed. In two great legal systems in the world, one was the Roman law, okay, and, and from say, say minus so 500 BC to 500 AD, roughly that thousand year period, and uh -huh. the other was the, the 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 English common law, which started maybe seven eight hundred years later for about a thousand years too until today, and they were both basically decentralized systems. They were not completely private. But they were not controlled by legislation and governments as we think of today. They basically okay. were – they resulted from two human beings who had a dispute, mm -hmm. and they needed this dispute resolved, and they knew that fighting each other would, would result in social ostracism or penalties. And so they had an, an incentive to go to some, some arbiter, some arbitrator who would decide right. the case, a judge basically. Okay. And they put their they put their dispute before them, and the judge tried to find the just result or the right result, and looked at precedent and tradition and expectations of the parties, and natural law and common sense, and made a decision and a, made an award. You get to own this, not you. Whatever. And over time, these principles uh, developed into the body of private law that we still rely upon today, right? Private uh, uh, contract law, property uh -huh. law, okay. tort law, things like that. Um, so the idea is that this would – this is what would happen in a private law society, and let me mention one more thing, and then um, – and that is that even in today's society, we have roughly 200 governments in the world. So mm -hmm. in a sense, we have anarchy right now between countries. Now, they do have treaties between each other, but that's analogous to private contracts. Okay. But there's no, there's no overlord government that makes all the countries abide by the treaties. And we have transnational commerce. You'll have a French company doing business with a, ten, you know, a, a Belgian company or whatever, right. and the contracts happen to be enforced. They find a way to do it through contract and through arbitration and through cooperation between the government's legal systems. So it's clearly possible to have anarchy in a sense. And one more thing. Uh -huh. There's a great article from the early Journal of Libertarian Studies. By Alfred Kuzan, who is not a libertarian, but it's a great article. It's called How uh, Do We Ever Really Get Out of Anarchy? And he points out that within a government, within a state, there's no overlord enforcer that makes them comply with the rules of the government itself. So uh -huh. even within a government, you have a type of anarchy because like say the US government, 
Okay. You have the Supreme Court issue a verdict, and Richard Nixon complies with it. He steps down because the Supreme Court said you have to turn over the tapes. Okay. Right? There's no pistols being pointed at him. There's just an interlocking series of understandings and social traditions and understand and agreements that result in a web of law uh -huh. that binds the people within the government itself. I mean, you see this playing out right now with all these um, the things with Trump and the and the, and the, and the Mueller and the Democrats. They're all playing this dance, but they're abiding by a certain set of rules that they respect. Okay. Shows not that these rules are valid or just or natural, but that it's possible to have a set of rules that do uh, that do bind actors within a system, and we think that that's possible within society at large. We just think that they should be just instead okay. of arbitrary and based upon force. Okay. Now, um, if now do. When let, let me let, let me tell you a little bit about my simple introduction to libertarianism, sure. and then you. So I, I, I mainly read Milton Friedman, um, specifically yes. his great book uh, "Free to Choose," which I've yes. read twice and gone through with my. Uh, well, I, not the book, but I went through the series TV series with my daughter, and yes. I watched that twice. It's on YouTube. I highly recommend it. I think he's one of the greatest intellectuals in history. Um, but um, um, would you say that that is a good starting point for somebody that kind of wants to jump into and learn more about this whole discussion? Because he, to me, seems like one of the most amazing teachers I've ever heard. Uh, I think he was great uh, in, my, in my personal sort of a pantheon of, of, of or, or, or lists of, of works. I, I, I think his, his book, Capitalism and Freedom, Okay. Is really the pinnacle of what he wrote in terms of libertarianism. Free to choose is, is really good too. Uh -huh. um, now he is more of a consequentialist and minarchist libertarian, but yes, he's fantastic. And up there, along with him, would be Henry Hazlitt in his book um, Economics in One Lesson. I think uh -huh. if you read one of the Milton Friedman books, Free to Choose, or the series, or his Capitalism Freedom and 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 um, and Henry Hazlitt, Economics in One Lesson, and the very short book by Frederick Bastiat that I mentioned earlier called uh -huh. the, the Law, which is uh -huh. from like 1850 or something. Those three things will give you a very solid foundation, mostly in consistency and economic thinking, right? Uh -huh. And and based upon kind of some simple principles of justice. But yes, I totally agree with you. Milton Friedman is great. He's not quite an anarchist, but right. he's uh, he's great. Okay, now I'm going to put you on the spot because or here's I di I didn't have an answer to my own question that I thought of after I saw the Free to Choose series, which was, wow, his this guy's arguments are so amazing. Um, you could I you could almost see somebody believing you know everything he says. So then it occurred to me that I should probably see the flip side, and then I was trying to think: is there some? Uh, communist Marxian mm -hmm. economist that maybe did a YouTube series as well that is equally mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. articulate to just kind of get a balanced uh, viewpoint uh, or the other side. So can you think of, I couldn't think of anybody that was the equal of Milton Friedman on the other opposing side. Can you think of somebody just to... No, and, and the, the, I hate these kind of questions. I mean, I, I don't blame you for asking, but the problem is... <laughs> If you don't have an answer, it sounds like you're you're not being objective. But um, like I, I'm like well known to be anti. I'm a patent lawyer, okay, and I'm against okay. the patent system. Uh -huh. And I do lots of talks and debates, and I'll get asked all the time, "Hey, Kinsella, we want to do. Would you? I'd like to do a debate instead of an interview. Could you recommend to me the top two or three people on the other side?" Okay. And un unfortunately, I think there are like literally no good arguments for IP. So I I'm always stumbling. It's not I'm, I'm not trying to sandbag it. I just can't find anyone. And on the question you asked, as I said earlier, I think there are some respectable arguments for um for for some kind of minimal state and some kinds of uh, interventions. Uh -huh. Not an intrusive state, but if you want to go say communism or totalitarianism, right. say against against some form of Western liberalism, some form of uh, of minimal or a limited state that we have now, I I think there are just no good arguments because the, just the empirical evidence alone, there's hundreds of millions of people killed, um, and just impoverishment, you know, in the last century alone by communism uh -huh. and forms of socialism. 
and I just don't – I mean I think that in 1991, you know, or 90, when, when, when communism fell, they, they basically lost their argument in an empirical sense. Now, in a more, mod- in a more moderate form, like if you argue for the welfare state – or yeah, was, let's 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 do that. That's, yeah. I think that probably the best arguments would be something like, say, Francis Fukuyama. Okay. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he had this provocative article which turned into a book in the night, I think, around 1991. Is it the end of history? Uh, yes, or, the end of history and the last okay. man. Okay. And they sort of argue that uh, it's sort of a neoliberal view that uh, uh, modern w- liberal democracy is the ultimate pinnacle of humanism, and you have to have a balance between. The desires of the masses, but you have to have capitalism in some form as the engine, from, you know, that provides growth and prosperity. But then mm-hmm. you have to have a state that redistributes it to it a bit. So I would say, and then John Rawls, of course, is the famous political philosopher. Um, and I'm blanking on the name of his book. We had a famous book in 1970 or something. Uh, a the- I think it's called A Theory of Justice. Uh-huh. And that's and that's the book that Robert Nozick, the famous the famous libertarian philosopher, argued against in his book Anarchy, State, and Utopia. So those sort of books are the antipodes of the two views, but they're all rooted in the liberal tradition in the sense that, say, John Rawls and these welfareists believe in some form of redistributionism, right? Uh-huh. But they don't believe in ultimate communism. I mean, you could look at Hillary Clinton and and, and Barack Obama and these guys. They don't really oppose the free market and capitalism. They understand that you can't have communism. You can't have central command of the economy. They may go a little bit too far, but they understand that the essential essence of the Western liberal system is commerce, trade, private property rights, free markets. They just think it has to be heavily regulated by other values. So right. the way the way I would pitch it is that like a libertarian like me, I think that you, you should not commit aggression against someone. You shouldn't steal from them. You shouldn't invade their body without their permission. I wouldn't say it's an absolute, but it's it's basically my principle. I think it's just wrong. Right. Whereas if you put it that way to the, the typical social democratic type thinking person, which is what most people are nowadays, they would say, well, I think that aggression is wrong, but there are other values, and we have to balance and weigh and juggle these things against each other. Right. So like yeah. – Equality is also important, and the, and some kids starving in Africa, give, being given food is also important. Right. I I think that a lot of those concerns um, would be would disappear if they had a better understanding of economics. Like if they understood the incentive systems that governments have to come with, mm-hmm. and basically the whole field of public choice economics, which explains why. A lot of the grand schemes and projects that th- these idealistic, utopian, progressive dreamers want to accomplish, they just cannot be accomplished because once you set a program in, in motion, it has its own inertia, and the people inside that program want to benefit themselves, right? Right. Well, see, now you've, you've, you – see, that's a – okay, so just uh, if I can try to – uh, reiterate some of what you said. So you believe in what you believe because you think it's right. And, but at the, at, towards the end of your comment, you were also saying that not only do I believe it's right, but it also provides the most benefit. Yes. And, and that's so, why, that's why I said earlier, I don't think there's a conflict between consequentialism and between deontological or principled approaches. I think they, 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 they dovetail together, but yes. Yeah. Okay. So in the in the the last part of our show, why don't we move into um, the talking a little bit about um, blockchains and uh, like Bitcoin? So a lot of people involved with this technology, I think, have visions that it's going to help promote a lot of the um, political and economic viewpoints that you share. Um, and a lot of people don't know if the government's going to eventually just figure out a way to kill it, and that's going to be the end of it. But uh, yes. yet, yet, what are your what's your experience with this technology, and kind of what are your thoughts on these sure. little vigilante little activists? Well, first of all, I'll say that uh, so I'm I'm a tra- I'm, I'm of the Austrian, which is Austrian economics, uh, uh-huh. which is like a hard money, pro gold, uh-huh. anti Federal Reserve, anti inflationary money tradition. 
and libertarian and suspicious of the government controlling money and the Fed. And so just from that point of view, there's aspects of, of just any kind of private money that attracts us, right? Uh -huh. um, and there are some Austrians who think that Bitcoin is impossible because they think that money has to arise from a, a physical commodity. I've never believed that. I've always thought that this is – I think that Bitcoin is a new phenomenon in the world. I think the, the idea of the blockchain uh, and aspects of, of – that it built upon Nick Szabo's idea uh -huh. or – or complete genius, and if we knew who who Satoshi was, I mean, he probably should get the Nobel Prize someday, just for the this new phenomena. And we're reaching a new stage of human evolution. There's lots of things happening. I think we can't predict what what's going to happen: artificial intelligence, three D printing, you know, encryption, right. uh, what D Doug Casey calls files, people, P H Y L E S, people associating with each other, not based upon their their ethnicity or their regions, but upon other affinities. Um, and I think Bitcoin could be extremely disruptive. Look, I'll, I'll say that I was, I, was, I was never skeptical of it in an economic sense like some of my fellow Austrians were, but I was skeptical uh -huh. that, I thought that the, I thought it might be a threat to the government if it ever became successful, and I thought the government would shut it down. I actually right. lost a bet against one of my friends in 2013 about that. <laughs> And I learned my oh, yeah. lesson. I, I paid him $100 in Bitcoin, which is now worth about $50,000. Okay, So I lost a $50,000 <laughs> bet. Wow. <laughs> but I, I wised up, and I bought some in 2014, and so now I'm just watching what happens. Uh -huh. um, and I think my hope and my, my, my somewhat prediction is that it's going to be something like Uber. Like Uber is something that – got popular so fast that it, by the time it got popular enough to raise the ire of the protected industries, the cab companies, etc., uh -huh. it was it, who were going to lobby the government to shut it down. It was too late. Right. And I think Uber has escaped the the clutches of the government because the government is slow and stupid, which is uh -huh. one thing we have in our favor. And I'm hoping that that happens with Bitcoin. By the time the government wakes up and tries uh, tries to outlaw Bitcoin. It will be too late, and also it's distributed again around the world. Right. So even if one or two or ten governments outlaw it, they're just going to be left in the dust by the countries that don't. And there are lots yes. of countries that don't have the dominant world money, mm -hmm. basically everyone except for the U.S. <laughs> right? <laughs> Smaller yeah. countries that don't they don't care if their currency is is outmoded by Bitcoin. So it's going to just prosper there. Right. My my guess is that Bitcoin could, if it emerges and, and gets more and more dominant. It could if it if it replaces say gold and then starts it starts becoming a haven for people to resort to instead of the inflationary currencies like the dollar and the euro and others mm -hmm. that it's going to severely limit the power of the government number one to to inflate and that's what funds government wars so it, it could have a direct effect on the ability of governments to wage war. It could yeah. also impact the government's ability to tax people and to regulate yes. the economy, to have currency, uh, currency uh, um, limitations, exchanges, and all that. Mm -hmm. So I think it could severely it, – it, it could end up being the thing that's the silver bullet or the stake in the, you know, stake in the, in, in the vampire, which is the state. It could kill a state. Now, this is an ambitious and utopian goal. Uh -huh. But I'm hopeful, and I do think that there's huge potential for Bitcoin. My personal view is I'm leaning more towards the Bitcoiners, um, the ones that believe that there can only there should probably only be one in the long run. It's probably uh -huh. going to be Bitcoin because of its uh, network effects, uh -huh. and that uh, that uh, that <laughs> you know I think is going very very high in the future, or I'm hoping that it will. So that's yeah. kind of my thoughts on Bitcoin. Although I admit that I'm a um, I'm an amateur and a uh, an right. outside no, that's good. No, that's yeah. really good. Uh, what if I could just add one other th supporting um, uh, p data point to your your optimistic uh, hope that this technology will get popular so fast that nobody can shut it down. One when I when people when people when I get in discussions about this very thing one. One thing I will remind people of is that think about Hollywood and how powerful Hollywood was and how hard they tried to basically re-engineer the internet to, to stop piracy, right? Yes. And, and they couldn't do it. And even today, there's still rampant, massive file sharing. And so freedom yes. won out. And so I use that to, to try to encourage people to remain optimistic that it is true that 
a technology can and, take and, off. Go ahead. Go ahead. And not yeah. So and so that's a key, the key point there is that all these things are basically based on technology. So as I mentioned, I'm a patent attorney and I'm a libertarian, but I'm I think copyright and patent law are two of the worst laws that we have and should be totally abolished. But uh -huh. I do. But thankfully, the advent of the internet and and and, and encryption and torrenting has basically made copyright almost obsolete. So yeah. even if you have strict laws against it, copying is going on at a rapid pace now. And, and as I think a Cory Doctorow pointed out, that you know the internet is a perfect copying machine. And right. at this point in history, copying will never get harder than it is now. It's yeah. it's only going to get easier. So so basically, technology has made copyright obsolete. Uh -huh. And I think the same thing is going to happen with patents because of 3D printing. So when you have 3D printing become more uh, more sophisticated, and, and I, I think it might take 30 or 40 years, but when you have people have a, a copying thing in their basement or down the block, and they can get an encrypted file of a pattern for an object, uh -huh. they can make whatever the hell they want. They don't need someone's permission, right? Right. So that's going to kind of help circumvent patent law, which is a good thing, I believe. It's sort of and like also the, gun control. As well, yes. uh, it's going to circumvent gun control and lots of things. It's going to cause some problems too. Okay, but that's freedom, freedom emerging, and I think that Bitcoin could do something similar with with money. Uh -huh. um, there's a great article by one of my favorite philosophers, my favorite philosopher Hans Hermann Hoppe, uh -huh. and he, he's got this article called "Banking Nation States." And well, I forgot the rest of the title, but it's in his it's one of his books. It's uh -huh. on his website, uh, HansHoppe.com. And he points out that there's a systematic way that the state over time takes control of society. So like it takes control of transportation. So like the, the Romans build the roads, right? It uh -huh. takes control of, of, of the courts and law, right, which uh -huh. are kind of quasi-private. And it takes control of education. All the kids have to go to government schools. Uh -huh. So it is, it, it's like an insidious way that it, it puts itself into society to get its tentacles of control – and finally, right. it gets control of um, of money in banking, like like you know how the government took over money, and then they cut the tide of gold, and they have the Federal Reserve. So it, it has these ways of warming its way into control over society. Right. And and but to my mind, that means that if you break the government's ability to control money, that's going to be a key turning point. I personally think that we, we're not going to have a libertarian or anarchist revolution. We're not going to have people marching in the streets. We're not going to have a victory by means of my fellow libertarians running around handing out pamphlets <laughs> to, to tell people to change their minds because right. we're always going to be a small, intellectual, geeky minority. That's not how you do things, uh -huh. but I think we're going to win for the same reason that communism collapsed. It's just collapse of its own weight. Uh -huh. And just because freedom is just more efficient, people are just not going to need the state. The state's going to – the state will wither away as Marx predicted, but not not in the way he predicted. It's going right. to wither away in favor of freedom and capitalism as people just have so much wealth and technology. They'll have little robot nano armies around them and, the, and 3D <laughs> printers and, right. and, 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 and encryption and billions of dollars in Bitcoin. And the government will just become increasingly irrelevant. That's my kind of my utopian dream and hope. Right, right. Um, I wonder if we can close with this, if you could say something encouraging to people like me. So I'm a nerd who focuses on technology, and I, I don't know as much about law and economics as, as you do. But it, it seems to me that with, with this technology, people that believe in freedom um, – agree with a lot of your program we we can almost use technology to make the same or even a more effective um uh change in society than than somebody that's say a politician you see what i'm saying that th this is like one of the first times i i've seen that technology somebody that's involved with technology could really make big political changes it, could you what, what do you think about that well i, I i'm I hate to be a Pollyanna, and uh, but I am optimistic. <laughs> no, be, feel free. And be I'm honest. Op be honest. Go ahead. Yeah, tell no, it I've like it is. Been optimistic, and and uh, I I don't like to be naive and to to say the state doesn't exist and that there aren't right. setbacks. But 
Um, yeah, I, so I agree. I agree with that. I think that technology is the key to the future, and I think wealth is the key to the future. And and we're we're at a cusp on the industrial revolution curve, right? So you think about human society had about the same standard of living for like five thousand years until about uh, two hundred fifty years ago, right. and then we started on this industrial revolution curve, which is an exponential curve, and we're we're accelerating even that now with the with potential AI, with three right. D printing. With nanotechnology, right. uh, with the internet, with mobile te technology, we're going to have telepathy pretty soon, effectively, right? With little things in our heads, and we can, uh -huh. and, and with 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 this kind of money and the power of the state's going to go away. And te I think technology is the key to the future. Um, I, I I don't want to say it's it's a given. We we could have gray goo and stuff ourselves out with uh, religious ideology and with war and with bioterrorism. Uh -huh. Okay. Nu nuclear war, it's possible, uh -huh. and I, I, I think even if we have nuclear war, it'll be horrible, but it'll just set back humanity for 300 years, and then we'll finally reemerge, <laughs> or maybe uh -huh. maybe 50 years. So it'll be bad for us, but in the long run, maybe we'll survive. So okay. um, I'm hopeful. My only concern is that we, you know, is, what's the is it Freeman Dyson or someone who said, or, or the physicist who said, well, where are they? It's not Dyson; it's someone else. But you know, it's like we ha we don't hear any signals from outer space, so that implies right. that life is either very rare or it snuffs itself out. I'm hopeful that it's very rare, and that's why we don't hear from them. But um, <laughs> no, I'm very optimistic about. I think things are getting better. We're richer. We're healthier. We're uh, and and uh, 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 technology is is going to enable us. We're, we're at the cusp of great things. Uh, we're 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 young gods, I think. I hope and or, or uh -huh. that our, our grandchildren will be gods. Okay. <laughs> Interesting, interesting thought. Well, um, thank you. Thank you, Stefan, for sharing your thoughts. You're obviously very educated, very talented uh, person. And uh, so, yeah, thank you. And uh, maybe we'll have you on the show again sometime in the future. Be happy to uh, do it. All right. Did any other last closing thoughts or comments well, you want to make? I would just say one thing. I would say that um, you, you mentioned, you know, uh, like I sound like I'm educated on law and economics and um, – I would say this. I, th I think that uh, uh, specialists – you don't have to be a specialist to understand enough to understand a lot about the world. Uh, right. If you understand technology, that's a key thing, and all the rest that you need is a little bit of honesty and sincerity and consistency in your thinking and mm -hmm. uh, just a little bit of economic literacy. And like I said, if you just read Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, yeah. if you understand the law of supply and demand and a few basic laws of economics… That can help inform your thinking about higher level political norms. You don't need to be go to have an economics degree. In fact, that might, might be a detriment, right, with the way <laughs> things they're teaching in school. So right. it's not that hard to self educate yourself on a few basic things about economics and the basics of law. You don't have to go to law school. You don't have to be an economist to know enough to have an educated opinion about these matters, and then the, the technology is, is what I would say is key, the technological information. Immerse yourself in technology, and uh, I, I just try to take advantage of it and buy some Bitcoin, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. And with that, well, why don't we go ahead and we'll stop there. So thank you again, and uh, uh, best wishes to you this uh, holiday season. You too. All right. Bye. All right, bye.